So, I welcome you all to this uh, course on iron and steel making uh, MSc 421, <coughs> where I am going to take about uh, uh, 34 lectures, each comprising of about uh, 50 minutes, uh, and then uh, following that, we will have uh, about 5 or 6 problem solving uh, sessions. Uh, the course, as the title suggests, it is on the board, uh, iron making and steel making, it is split uh, into two different sections, non overlapping sections. Of course, uh, scientifically and principle wise, we will see there are a lot of commonalities, but you know, I have, we have segmented the course into two components that is iron making is the one sector and steel making is the other sector. And we will lay uh, more or less uh, equal emphasis on both these sections. Uh, so, following this 34 lectures or so, about 15, 16 or 17 lectures I will be spending on iron making and uh, remaining you know 16 or 17 lectures I will be spending on uh, steel making. And uh, as far as the problem solving goes, uh, we will do as you will see as problems or I will articulate that how to solve problems dealing with uh, material balance, uh, thermodynamics and kinetics and one specific category of problems which we call as a wrist diagram based problems. So, these are the four different kinds of problems that we will be tackling and each of these will be covered in one problem session. So, one one and a half problem session. So, we will have about 34 plus 6 about 40 contact hours. Now, Coming to the subject, uh, this is uh, a very important subject for metallurgists and all of you may be knowing that uh, iron and steel or particularly steel uh, is a very important engineering material. I mean you look at any structure around you and you will find you know starting from the utensils that you use in the morning to the automobile or the bicycle that you use to drive uh, uh, you know to the school uh, everywhere. Uh, even the steel chair that you you know uh, that you use uh, to sit before your computer terminal in your office that has also contains significant amount of steel. So, steel is virtually everywhere I mean and it is a, it is a integral component uh, of you know the present day or modern day uh, society. Now, per se I would say iron is the raw material for steel making. Okay? So, iron is not the finished good it is an intermediate product and once we refine uh, iron, uh, then we get steel. And most of you have a very preliminary and cursory knowledge of iron making and steel making. You have studied in your uh, inorganic chemistry or the grade 12 uh, chemistry course where you have spent about you know uh, maybe uh, I would say 10 pages of write up on iron and steel making and so. So, uh, I mean each of the topics actually in iron and steel making can be covered. Uh, in terms of a discrete course, but we cannot deal you know that exhaustively in this particular course. So, we will give you a good overview much deeper uh, than what you have studied uh, in grade 12 level, but the mini terminologies that I am going to you know uh, use in this particular course will not be entirely new that you are going to be familiar because of your prior exposure to the subject of chemistry, but we will deal here do not misunderstand that iron and steel making is only chemistry it is a very engineering subject in its core and we will see how the engineering uh, principles that you have studied in the second year level, third year level you know those can be applied uh, to study uh, the subject uh, scientifically. Now, as I have mentioned steel is a very important uh, material for the development of the society and uh, steel industry is a mammoth industry actually. And uh, totally if you look at uh, the world production uh, you will see that uh, something like 1870 MMT and that is what we write like million metric tons. Okay? So, it is 1.87 billion tons of steel is produced uh, globally uh, in which year and that is the two, 2019 statistics. And each ton of steel uh, approximately cost about half a lakh of rupees. So, you can imagine the financial implication of the business as far as steel production is uh, concerned. And of this I just want to quote so that you get an idea that India produces or India produced about 111 tons of steel in 2019, while 
the entire Asia, Asia is the hub of the iron and steel industry. China, Japan and India are leading and we have something around 1342 million metric tons. And India is the second largest steel producer in the whole world. Uh, immediately behind us is Japan. Okay? And of course, we are, you know, China is the first or the most uh, predominant uh, producer of steel. And China's share is something around of this 300, you know, 1342 million metric tons, China produces around 1 billion tons of steel or 1000. India produces around 100, Japan produces around 100, Korea about 50, 60, and the remaining are among small countries like Vietnam, etc. And that's how the, so this is India, this is Asia, and this is world. That's the production. So it's a big business. And engineering, as you know, is creation of wealth. So the industries have to make money. Life has to be simpler. The technology has to improve. The pollution has to go around. There are so many, you know, uh, aspects, important aspects related with the steel producing, uh, steel production sector uh, that can be addressed once we study uh, iron making and steel making. Now, steel as I said, it is everywhere and uh, is an integral part of our life and actually uh, if you uh, take the per capita steel consumption, that means if India produces 100 million tons of steel and India's population is say 134 crores, okay, so that's is equal to this is the number of population. So this represents the park, this is million metric tons, so this is so many kg, so million metric tons, so this is becomes ton and this is becomes kg. So this becomes kg per person and which we call as kg per person and this we call as the per capita steel consumption of a country. So, you can see that India roughly as of now produces, you know, per capita steel consumption is between 75, I am, you know, it is going to be actually 1, if you look at it, 11100 zero zero divided by 134. So, this is going to be roughly about 80. So, 80 kg per person is the steel consumption. And steel, this per capita steel consumption is a very important parameter in terms of uh, determining uh, how good a country is doing, you know. Uh, the wealth is measured today or the affluency of a society or the development of a society is measured by the term, you know, by the end quantity that what is the per capita steel consumption and this is still not satisfactory because most of the advanced countries like uh, developed countries I would say would be consuming, you know, 200, at least 200 to 300 kg per ton. This is the statistics of countries like US, Japan, uh, Germany, etc. And that essentially indicates when you consume this much of steel per person, that means everybody owns a car, everybody has a washing machine because all these structures, everybody had a freeze because all these structures have steel. So therefore, you know, the per capita steel consumption is an index of prosperity of a nation. And as you can see here, we have a long way to go from 80 uh, to 300, uh, you know, and then, uh, you know, if you look at government of India's projection, the government of India wants to produce, you know, from this to about 300 million metric tons MMT by the year 2000. So somewhere around 2050, the population in this country is going to be stabilized and this will give us something like 170, 160 kg of steel park. Uh, person uh, or per capita steel consumption which will be not too bad with regard to the global average of 200, 250 and 300. So I think this point is clear that you know production of steel as well as consumption of steel within a country is the index of its prosperity and we are trying to get to a value of 250 to 300 kg per person knowing that. So it is a very important subject, it is a big business as the number indicates, it is a, you know we need steel you know, to, be, to grow. So, the development, why, the, why India still is growing, you know, production is growing. So, if you look at India's statistics, India's statistics, I will discuss the Indian steel plants a little bit more detail later on towards the end of the course. So, 1947, India produced about 1 million ton, million metric ton. Come 1985, 
India produced about 10 million ton metric ton. 2019, as I have indicated, it is 101 million metric ton and come 2013, the projection by the ministry is that we will have 300 million metric ton. And why? Because, you know, we have developed so quite a bit. I mean, 20 years back, very few Indians used to have cars. Today, many Indians have car and that, you know, has been reflected in the production of steel in the country. I mean, today, we have so many bridges over Ganges. Imagine 30, 40 years back, there were how many bridges over Ganges in Jamuna? And all these structures are made out of steel. So, we want in the villages, you know, in our, when we are young, uh, all the village bridges and houses were built up with muds, bricks, etc. Today, a good number because afforestation is now no more allowed because of the global warming and, you know, emission of the greenhouse gases. So, the plants, you know, uh, provide enough, their number provide enough reason for us to survive. And therefore, we can say that since we are not able to use or the, or the, or the, or the or a developed society does not want to chop off the plants and use it for making bridge, house, etc. Uh, so, therefore, the thrust is that we have to have, you know, more permanent structure because steel is engineering, uh, you know, as a, as a very good engineering material. It has enormous amount of strength. You can imagine that when you will have, uh, you know, uh, the ropeway which is being now constructed uh, from, I think, uh, uh, Dharamshala to MacLeod Ganj. So, this is a big ropeway which is coming up in the Uttarakhand and you can imagine that, you know, the wires on which uh, the ropeway will move, the gears, the wheels, the flywheels, all of these are going to be very high quality steel. So, <coughs> steel is a very tough material, it is a very durable material, it is a highly recyclable material. So, I am just trying to emphasize that why we should want to study because the iron and steel making for metallurgists, it occupies such a predominant position in terms of business, in terms of society, in terms of development that there is no doubt that every metallurgist must have a reasonable idea of the subject and we have to study it not as a descriptive or you know uh, so, sort of a history or detail, we have to study it from a scientific standpoint so that we should be able to play with various operating parameters etcetera. Uh, producing better quality steel, uh, reducing the pollution, reducing the cost of production per ton and so on and so forth. So, with this little background, I think I have made that point that iron and steel making is a very important subject as far as because I cannot, I can go on and on, but that is not desirable I think. So, steel production is increasing continuously, our life has increased, our life has improved over the years. You must, have, <clears throat> you compare your own life and I see my own life and we can see and in that uh, steel has played or his steel continues to play an extremely important role. I will now try to give you a perspective of uh, uh, you know the histor historical pers perspective of steel making, iron steel making. So, I would say that modern steel making has started somewhere around 1850 that is the era. So, from this onwards is the era of modern steel making. So, modern steel making is not even 200 years old, you can see, okay. We are not at 2050, so it is about 170 years old, that is modern steel making. And this is why, what is the reason? It is in this year that the Bessemer process of steel making, Bessemer process again, you have heard, you know, heard the terminology, you have studied uh, the process may be, you know not in detail, but uh, in a sketchy way. So, eight, around 1850, the Bessemer steel or Bessemer, uh, you know, commercialized the uh, Bessemer process, which of course, now is obsolete. We have better uh, technology and the, so, so the starting of the Bessemer steel making process or the commercialization of the Bessemer steel making process is acknowledged as the beginning of the modern steel making. Uh, and you can imagine that, you know, uh, how the steel making. If you look at, uh, I think, uh, the statistics, so I would say uh, around 1870, we have uh, 0.5 million metric tons of steel produced. We are now going back in time, okay. So, that is uh, around 1880, the global production I am talking about is about 1 million 
metric ton. Around 1890, it is about 28 million metric tons and about 1980, we produced about 650 million ton. And today, 2019, we produced, as I have written the figure here, 1870 million metric ton. And this has been the result of many innovations which have start, you know, take, taken place during the uh, period of, you know, from, for, since 1850. So many we will study in this particular courses. I will, will note that what are the developments that have really key developments that have taken place which played pivotal roles in, you know, increasing the product, global production of steel. These are the not iron production, these are steel, crude steel production. We will distinguish between crude steel and finished steel later on when you delve deeper into the uh, subject. So, if you now travel back and uh, we find that uh, the account uh, is there that uh, almost about 2000 to 2500 years before the common, earlier we used to write BC before Christ, these days people write it before common era, which means before the birth of Christ. Okay? So, that means if you add now, we are almost 2000 years after Christ. So, therefore, it is about 4000, 4500 years old. Now, all of you must have wondered, you know, that uh, the iron is, uh, iron is uh, you know, available in abundance in the earth's crust relative to, I would say, copper, zinc, etc. But still, if you look at historically, the copper and the bronze age preceded the iron age, despite the fact that everywhere iron was av available. Of course, iron is available in nature or in the planet as what is known as hematite or what is known as predominantly as magnetite. These are the, there are many various other mineralogical you know, compositions, but um, the iron uh, which is produced, you know, ex which exists in the earth's crust is predominantly in these two oxide uh, forms. Okay? And of this, I think Fe2O3 or hematite, this is hematite, this is magnetite, the relative proportion of uh, hematite is larger than the magnetite. So, despite the fact, on the other hand, if you look at the copper ore, copper ore, copper extraction also you must have studied in your grade 12, copper, uh, you know, uh, ore is uh, scarcely distributed over the uh, earth's crust. Zinc is the same thing, but despite their you know, not widespread, non-widespread availability, copper and zinc were extracted first and, you know, we, we, we therefore have the bronze age, you know, copper age and bronze age preceding the iron age despite the fact that time. So, the primitive people were not in a position to take out iron from iron ore and that is precisely because of the reason that the iron strength of the iron oxygen bond in iron ore is very, very strong, okay. In order to break this, all of you must have done thermodynamics in your second year level and we know that in, you know, uh, how the standard free energy of formation for pure iron oxide from, you know, one atom of iron and one mole of oxygen from the oxide Dillingham diagram, okay. So, we can have an idea of the strength of the bond. So, in order to, you know, you can, how can you extract iron? Basically, in layman's term, if you can somehow remove oxygen, that means you got iron. So, to remove oxygen, you have to have, you have to take away the oxygen out of it, but the bond being so strength, strong that primitive people did not have the technology or means to break this bond in order to isolate iron from uh, hematite. So, therefore, uh, the, you know, extraction of iron is, uh, you know, was halted to quite some extent and that is precisely the reason that despite the fact that we had abundance iron ore available on the earth's crust, they are readily available, you know, copper and the bronze age preceded the iron age. And by the time as copper and bronze age matured, you know, the society started to become technologically more and more advanced, new things were discovered, you know, and then uh, new ways of making fire, new ways of, you know, pushing oxygen into a combustion chamber, etc. Of course, you know, not as it is or as they are in the modern day, but those you know, periodic developments actually usured the area of steel making or iron making per se. I would say iron making started and steel making started from the 1850. So, whatever before we have done before 1850 were essentially iron making, which essentially 
was concerned about breaking of the oxygen iron bond and therefore somehow isolating iron. Now, to break this bond, you have to supply thermal energy and you have to use, you know, or an element which has a, which has a greater affinity towards carbon. So, the oxygen, the moment if you can create a condition under which oxygen has greater affinity towards carbon or primitive man of course did not have access to hydrogen. Today, we are talking about hydrogen also, so, hydrogen iron making, you know, through uh, hydrogen reduction. So, if you, if you can have certain elements create a condition that the oxygen, iron oxygen bond can be broken and then this oxygen can be captured or trapped by either H. So, I, I am saying that if the resultant product between H and O which is H2O, if the resultant product between C and O which is either C or CO2 is more stable at a given environment then Fe2O3 then only we will be able to create uh, you know uh, isolate iron from iron ore and if you look at our you know in the second year level you have studied the Ellingham diagram delta G naught as a function of temperature you would find that this happens it is an idealistic graph and this temperature this is the T and this temperature is about you can completely take away the oxygen 900 degree centigrade or 1273 degree Kelvin and this what are these lines these are standard free energy of formation for I would say the first you must understand that uh, one more thing that removal does not take place in uh, one step removal takes place like this if we 2 3 then it becomes if one tries to remove oxygen by putting in carbon by creating then the removals takes place in steps and these are this is the step in which. So, you see the initial material, you see the final material, but you do not see this, but nevertheless this happens like this and here if you can look at oxygen to iron ratio, okay, then you will see it is 1.5, this is 1.33, this is roughly 1, we will say the word roughly I use that will be clarified later on in this course and then this is 0. So, this is O by Fe ratio. So, most significant reduction takes place from 1 to 0, this is the largest reduction in oxygen. So, these are easily reducible, you can make this from this from this very easily, you can make this from this relatively easily, but to do, take it take FeO, the last bit of oxygen which is tied up with Fe as FeO will become extremely difficult. So, this line is Fe we are concerned with okay? and then we have FeO and this is C plus 2C plus O2 and this is equal to CO. <coughs> so, though it shows that this is the free energy chain. So, the standard free energy chain for carbon monoxide okay, formation is, great, is, is less than that of it is more negative. This is the negative way, it is lesser than this. So, the relative stability of iron ore of iron oxide beyond 900 degree centigrade FeO is less stable than CO. So, if I create a temperature of 900 degree centigrade or 1000 degree centigrade then put some carbon okay, in, in contact with FeO or Fe2O3 I will be able to isolate, but isolate iron from iron ore, but creating that temperature 3000 or 4000 years back was not that easy and this explains that why people in 5000, 6000 years back could isolate copper and zinc are low melting point or you know they are in combination copper sulphide, the copper and sulphur bond strength is not nowhere in comparison to the strength of the iron and oxygen bond here. It is very easily isolated, you can separate copper from sulphur relatively easily at a much smaller temperature, but in order to isolate iron from if you, you will require more than 1000 degree centigrade. So, one important point I would like to say that iron melts at about pure iron melts about 1539 degree centigrade. I am quoting several figures and this you know those of you who are interested uh, to pursue iron in steel making as a career you have to remember all these things. Pure iron melts at 1539, but we know that as carbon gets into iron its melting point depression takes place. Okay? 
with carbon getting into pure iron, the density of iron decreases, iron becomes lighter and as a result of which what happens the carbon also you know in addition to that the carbon also decreases the melting point of iron. So, that is what you can see in the iron by iron carbon diagram. If you look at the iron carbon diagram all these lines are sloping downward and this is the percentage carbon okay? and this is you know the temperature here and the slopes are not this way because with the increase in carbon these are the liquidized of the solidus line you know. So, therefore, pure iron melts at 1539 they had difficulties in getting to a temperature of 900 degrees centigrade which essentially tells us that primitive people 4000 years back uh, men were not in a position to you know extract iron in liquid state at all because extracting iron in liquid state will necessitate a temperature of 1500 degree centigrade when people were struggling to create a temperature of about 900 degree centigrade forget about getting. So, the liquid iron production came much later okay? and primitive men basically produced uh, what is you know uh, known as wrought iron which is a mixture when they mix carbon with iron and oxygen some carbon escapes as carbon monoxide, but some carbon also get mixes with iron. So, the iron is now soft, the iron becomes porous because the oxygen has left the iron matrix or the iron ore matrix and as a result of which in, in those pores, more tiny pores what happens the carbon particle gets in and the iron that you get is basically an alloy of iron and carbon that is what primitive people were producing and then by hammering they would remove you know all the unwanted material or the carbon particle and isolate iron in the solid state and those would be used to make the arrows, uh, to make the spears which primitive people would be used using uh, for hunting operations and so on and so forth. So, this thing continued for several years because may, people were not able to uh, you know and this is you must understand now that carbon is a solid and, and if you, so this is a solid state reduction if you write this if you 2 3 solid and then carbon, carbon solid and then that gives you F e plus suppose C o and this is also solid and this is gas. So, it is a solid solid reduction, solid state reduction and the solid state reduction is extremely slow that you know because in solid state what happens the reaction proceeds by diffusion mechanism. So, therefore, the rate of iron production was extremely small. If you go back to about 3000 BCE, so 1000 years back the common era to so 3000 BC, okay, uh, this is 1000 BC, 1000 before the common era that means 3000 years back from today roughly and then you find that iron was produced, the furnace was you know the chamber in which it was produced was not too scientifically designed. So, these were basically pots or uh, you know stall little bit of uh, you know uh, like uh, shaft furnace structure, but very very small. How small? This could be you know about 16, 15, 16 feet height. So, where there are there is to be hills and between the hills people would construct such shaft furnaces by you know carving out uh, material uh, you know and uh, on the from the surface of the mountain and so on and because between the mountains or in the valleys you know there could be channelization of wind because wind will be needed in order to produce the heat because you will have how the heat is going to be produced if you want to generate this you have to have carbon first burning with carbon monoxide okay and that's how the heat is going to be produced so, burning of carbon would be producing for this we require air you do not have any you know modern day compressors to pump in the air. So, what you look for? You look for those regions you know near the iron ore mines where there is a good draft of air such that radio oxidation of carbon can take place or coal can take place and therefore, you can generate or come to a temperature about more than 900 degree centigrade. So, this sort of a furnace as I said so under solid state would be producing 350 kg of iron in a day or so that is what is the kind of production. Today if you look at the figure it is it is a mind boggling figure. Today the furnace is about maximum is about 35 meter that means if you multiply roughly so it is about 105 feet. 
and how this is the size height of the reactor that we have built up okay which you, you know is called the blast furnace which is the predominant reactor for iron making these blast furnaces have what is the diameter 15 meters 45 feet could be you know from this wall to this wall that's that's the span you know the much bigger than the span of the board itself and this alone could be producing how many tons of steel a day iron a day this could be producing something like 13000 to 15000 tons per day tpd this is the iron production and this is i am talk, talking to a some somewhere around approximately 4 million metric ton blast furnace pa million metric ton per annum that is the abbreviation blast furnace and we have many blast furnaces in the whole world you know maybe around 50 60 blast furnaces which are as big as this size of blast furnaces 4 million ton 5 million ton annual capacity one single furnace producing 5 million tons of steel uh, iron uh, over a year so from 3000 years you know back uh, the advancement has taken place you know in stages and you can this is clearly enumerated here and you can see and mostly the biggest advantage or the largest you know uh, improvement have taken place uh, once the industrial realized you know about 200 years back following the industrial uh, uh, revolution so our entry into anthropocene anthropocene is a anthropocene is a terminology which is used you know uh, the period where the global warming has taken place so we have been burning more and more fuels the energy consumption in the world has increased lot of greenhouse gas has been uh, so this is a warm period and this is the last 200 years or so and during this 200 years really the phenomenal development in iron and steel making has taken place as it is evident from this particular so from several kgs per day production you know period gradually and gradually we have improved and how could we improve because our understanding of the subject improved considerably even the understanding today is not perfect there are significant scopes for improvement if not in terms of productivity perhaps in terms of greenhouse gas emission perhaps in terms of fossil fuel consumption perhaps in terms of recycling of material perhaps in terms of usage of the slag that we produced from the iron and steel making reactors 30 percent of the iron and steel production is the slag so you can imagine if we have produced how much 1870 million metric tons of steel you can roughly say about 500 to 600 million tons per annum slag is produced and slag is a waste material and today we know the slag is not a waste material we have to recycle the slag in order to protect the environment in order to make this you know keep this planet habitable because if you can if because we, every country today india is consuming steel tomorrow senegal will be consuming steel okay so there are many countries which require to be developed so the steel consumption is going to last you know, for quite long time we will never be saturated okay and steel as you all know even though the iron ore may be depleted and the grade of iron ore may go down but steel can be produced from you know recycled scraps you must have heard that all those you know uh, waste steel from the world trade center uh, which you know uh, collapsed about 20 years back or so uh, they they were actually taken to different countries and sold and there are many buildings in the world which have come up you know where the recycled uh, steel from the world trade center has been steel steel is a highly recyclable uh, material actually so you can see that <clears throat> if we, if you know uh, production has increased so much over the years and slag has also been increased so there is a you know con con there is considerable interest for us in order to see that these waste materials and also we will see that lot of gases also come out from the iron and steel making reactor okay which tends to pollute the environment and how the waste from iron and steel making can be effectively used for the benefit of the planet or as an input material for other processes is an important subject and that also will be given some attention towards the later part of the course now <clears throat> so this is the global uh, perspective of iron and steel making and also the iron and steel making subject how it evolved and what is the current uh, scenario so with this background now let us uh, look at uh, you know the iron and steel making sector 
uh, very briefly the, in terms of its history. I have given this history with respect to this is the Indian figure and it is you know not only it is good to know the subject but it is good to know about the heritage of iron and steel making in India. India also if you go if you look at the history uh, India you know almost 3000 years back high quality steel which we call as a crucible steel was produced in India and there is a good account of it and you all know uh, about you know uh, the iron pillar of Delhi you also know about the Damascus sword which was made out of wood steel. So, there is now it is a proven document that you know good amount of high quality steel used to be produced in India uh, uh, you know as early as uh, 3000 years back from today and the position since independence I have outlined here. So, the, you know steel production is growing and it is expected to grow uh, you know for the next 10 years or so if not more and then <coughs> we have you know uh, when in 1947 when India became independent okay that is the time when we started Hindustan Steel Limited the government of India started okay that we have a lot of plans the IIT started uh, the steel production started because India has to start building itself and that is how you know the Hindustan Steel uh, has been started by the government of India. Of course, the oldest steel plant in India is the Barnpur steel plant which was set up uh, you know by a private sector company and um, the Tata steel in, in the integrated sector I think it is 1907 if I am not wrong. Uh, uh, the first uh, actually steel ingot came out from Tata steel in Jamshedpur which is more than now 100 uh, you know 110 years or so. So, the initial period we have seen Hindustan steel you know uh, as well as Tata steel playing the major uh, role in terms of the you know supplying the domestic steel requirement and today of course, we have many large players in this steel industries. In India steel is produced uh, you know uh, both in public sector as well as in private sector and HS Hindustan steel limited is now renamed as the steel authority of India limited. So, we have public sector and private sector both contributing to steel uh, pr production in the country. And the dominant player in public sector are say as you all know Arayana Rashtriya Ishpat Nigam Limited and NMDC National Mineral Development Corporation. These are the major uh, public sector companies producing and private sector it is the Tata, Jindal and so Tata still you know this is JSW and there are many other small players contributing to 111 uh, metric tons of steel in the country. Now if you look at the Indian steel industry is a very interesting industry in the sense that most of the countries have two different approaches now for producing steel iron and steel. One we call as an integrated steel mill and the other we call as you know secondary or EAF based electric arc furnace based steel making. So, these are the two diff most of the countries if you if you take me you know, to go to any refer to any predominant you know large iron and steel making producing countries like Japan, China etcetera you will find 90 percent of their steel is being produced in the two sectors. These are basically this produces integrated steel mill produces liquid steel ok. Uh, it is a liquid iron from blast furnace on the other hand the source of iron here are the scrap material ok. It is not iron ore. So, from iron ore through blast furnace steel is produced and here in secondary units we have scrap and from scrap we produce uh, steel. Like primitive people we also produce today so iron in the solid state ok. Just like the way 3000 years back people were producing you know. Uh, solid iron today also we produce solid irons and those partially reduced iron are called DRIs and these DRIs are direct 
reduced iron. That means you take iron ore, you take carbon or coke or coal, whatever is available to you, and then you subject this in a reactor at a high temperature, and what you get is a more or less porous mass of solid iron containing lot of carbon in it, and we call it as DRI. And this DRI becomes freed along with scrap in the EIF based steel plant. We will discuss all these things in great detail. So, these are the two sectors, predominant sectors of steel production uh, in almost all country. But in India, we have a third sector, okay, and that is called the induction furnace steel making. So, this is also scrap based. So, these are basically remelting units. So, they remelt steel scrap, no refining is to be taken, no impurities to be driven off and then they cast uh, the resultant liquid steel you know uh, into different shapes uh, to sell into the market. So, we have integrated steel mills in India, we have secondary or arc furnace based steel makings, they produce mostly what is known as a special steels okay? that those you know ropeway wires, uh, the crankshaft of an automobile or an engine, okay? all these delicate parts which require you know high performance. Uh, during their service uh, or good service life, they are produced uh, in secondary or the electric arc furnace based steel plants and which are known to be producing uh, specialty steel. These integrated steel mills mostly produce, mostly produce uh, carbon steels which are used for making of you know houses, bridges, roads, etcetera. They are called carbon steels. On the other hand, they are producing or these are producing specialty steels. These are also producing only carbon steels, they remelt carbon steel the buy scrap from all of you see after a car accident the cars are you know uh, dumped on the roadside after railway accident the railway bogies or the wagons are dumped uh, you know by the side of the track and what happens to this so these materials are auctioned and bought, bought by the induction steel induction furnace uh, steel producers and they remelt them in induction furnace okay induction furnace means so you have you have electricity so, the energy is generated because of the induced current okay, and then when you charge scrap material uh, which you, have, you, can, you can melt it, you can create very high temperature and then once it is molten, molten then you can cast it into different shapes and then sell it uh, to the market. And if you look at our 111 metric ton, so the statistics go something like 70 million tons metric tons is our integrated steel production. That means, Tata Steel, Jindal, Sail, RINL, NMDC, these are the plants which will produce about size, about 70 metric tons. Secondary steel plant, there are about 30 odd steel plants, about 10 million tons and these are something like 30 million metric tons. These are very small plants, every here and there you can find such plants mushrooming. Okay? each plant may be producing thousands of tons of steel. Here each plant may be producing several hundred thousand tons of steel. Here each plant may be producing million tons of steel per annum. So, million tons per annum because integrated steel plants are enormous, they require land. Those of you who come from Jamshedpur or Vishakapatnam must be knowing the amount of land the steel integrated steel plant can use. So, unless you produce more, unless you sell more, unless you make more profit, you are not going to be viable. So, therefore, these integrated steel mills are very large and they produce huge amount of steel. In Tata Steel's Jamshedpur works, somebody was telling me they produce 12 million tons of steel uh, per annum. Similarly, in Jindal Steel Bellari works, somebody was telling me that you know they intend to produce uh, in next 5 years, uh, take the capacity to about 22 million tons in one single. Because the risk, you know, capital expenditure is extremely high in these big plants. Capital expenditure is moderate here and it is peanuts here and that is why they can survive by buying scrap and you know the annual capacity of the plant could be you know something like 10,000 to 40,000 tons per annum. So, 10,000 means it is 300 kg per day and you can imagine that is kind of a production we are talking about 3000 years back. Okay? And today's production as you can as, you, as, as I have noted is 13 to 14,000 tons of iron you know uh, per day uh, from a 3.5 or 4 million ton uh, blast furnace itself. So, therefore, these are and 
less as I said. So, 70 plus 30 is 100 plus 10. You have about you know in India 10 such integrated steel mills. Okay. Uh, you have about 30 such special steel plants and the number you can imagine this here it is more than 3000 such units are there. So, 3000 units more than 3000 units and these records are there in the ministry of steel more than 3000 units are there around 30 units are there and here may be approximately 10 units are there. 10 units producing 70 million ton, 30 units producing 10 million ton and more than 3000 units producing about. So, you can imagine they have their furnace capacities. The furnace capacity here is going to be something like 3 ton induction furnace, 4 ton induction furnace. Okay? You come to here, the furnace capacity will be 50 ton and you go there, the furnace capacity will be as high as 320 tons. So, this is a scaling up, you can, you can imagine that the range uh, you know uh, over which the steel plants uh, in the country exist. So, and they all produce diverse grades of steel and uh, as you know that we have make in India program, we have to produce good quality steel for our satellites, for our special applications in the energy sector, in the power sector, we require very high quality steel. So, there is considerable interest that not only the production of steel goes up, but also the quality of steel that we produce also increases to a significant extent. So, <coughs> this gives us an overview of uh, you know we will we'll study, we will take one full lecture on iron and steel making in India and discuss all these things in uh, greater detail. But so, today I would say that we you know in this first lecture, I have been able to give you an impression uh, about the importance of the subject of iron and steel making, why we should study. I have explicitly stated the volume of steel produced, uh, you know, the quantum of business involved and from an engineering perspective the importance of this uh, subject uh, as far as uh, you know iron and steel production goes. I have given you a good background of uh, the you know global current global scenario and how it has evolved since the days of uh, Bessemer which is 1850 and that is what I had listed. Uh, right here a few units back which I have erased and from there you know how the steel production has increased uh, with time and I have said that you know that this has been possible because of tremendous development uh, in the technology which we will study in this particular course from the scientific point of view and parallelly I have also shown that how the steel production in India you know from 3000 years back we have a history of steel production or iron production as old as 3000 years, but since independence how the steel production uh, has increased that account has been given, what is our future plan, how much of steel we you know per capita steel consumption is representative of India and to what extent it is to be improved that also has been discussed. And finally, you know I have given you a consolidated picture, a very small though that the manufacturing sector, how the structure, what is the structure of the manufacturing sector, how steel is produced in the country uh, you know and different proportions or different contributions of uh, induction furnace versus arc furnace versus the blast furnace root of iron and steel making in the country. So, we will continue and we will now have the background. So, with this introduction about the course, uh, I think we are now all set uh, to go into uh, discussing uh, you know, over the next 16 lectures or so the subject of iron making and that is going to be the lecture in tomorrow's class.